We are live. Hey, it's Warthog Wednesday. Welcome to everybody. This is episode 002. So you'll recall, hopefully, that uh, episode one, I had my old boss from the uh, 511th Fighter Squadron, the Vultures, my combat squadron. And today, I've got the second best guest. I've got his crew chief. Scott Atwood was crew chief on uh, airplane 180-157, the Fighting Irish. Because uh, that was the boss's jet. Scott, good to have you here, bud. Welcome. I get a beer. So, Scott, you were like a 23, 24 year old kid, maybe 22 even, right? What? How old were you? Oh, I was. 20, you were I, I was probably 20. I think I was just okay. turned 20, 21, maybe. Yeah. So here we got this uh, like 21 year old kid, uh, fresh faced kid. You actually look exactly the same, frankly. <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> this, this is great. Me too. I'm going to say I look exactly the same as well, but I don't. I look old. Anyway, uh, so Scott was the crew chief on the boss's jet, which is which is a high honor, by the way. First of all, to be a crew chief on a fighter jet in the United States Air Force is a big deal. It takes a lot of experience, uh, really sharp guy, because this is a guy that is responsible for, for you know, handing those keys over, saying she is code one, good to go, fly safe, bring her back, see when you get back. And uh, and also given that last salute, uh, hopefully not the last salute, but the last salute before the flight. And so um, it's a big deal to be a crew chief. It's even a bigger deal to be the crew chief on the squadron commander's jet. <laughs> so tell us a little yes. bit about, uh, before we get there though, tell us um, kind of who you are, where you came from, how you end up in the Air Force and just kind of what, what I said to you before before we went on the air, I said, just give us about the five minute, you know, birth to now on Scott Atwood. You know, I I, I went into, uh, I, I right out of high school, went into Army Guard or Army Reserve, did 18 months in that, hated it. Uh, Where'd you grow up? What what town? Uh, I Northern California in the Bay Area. Oh, all right. So nice. uh, beauty. So I grew up in the Bay Area, uh, always, always interested in aviation. Um, Went ahead and uh, did my my 18 months in the Army Reserve in Signal, which is the communications branch of yeah. the Army, right. because they didn't have any they didn't have any Army aviation uh, openings or uh, units up there. Um, ended up uh, doing my 18 18 months. Um, called the Army Arm. I I was I I moved from Northern California back to Southern California, uh, where all my family was. And asked them the, you know, I called the recruiter and, you know, I called all the recruiters. You're looking for a unit to I get into. And they were like, no, we don't have anything down here. So I called the Air Force. I said, okay, here's the deal. I'm Army Reserve. Put me on active duty. Can you do that? He's like, yeah, come on down. Let's sure. talk about what your options are. I said, there are no options. Just go ahead and put me on active duty. <laughs> no next thing I know, I'm, uh, I'm uh, leaving for uh, – San Antonio, go to boot camp again, and uh, I went in open mechanical, and my I got my first choice, which was tactical aircraft maintenance, and uh, I was at the very, very end of my uh, school, had not got a, a, a slot yet. Everybody got F-4s, T-38s, uh, B-52s. There was a couple B-52 guys in there with us, even though they were tactical. Um, were you, were you, what, what I got was my that? Shepherd? That was Shepherd. Yeah, that yeah, was a Shepherd. That's where I, where I went to pilot training. So I was the only guy out of the class that got A10. I didn't know what an A10 was. I remember that A10. Wasn't there one in the hangar there, though? That you guys there, had the there, I think there was one out on the flight line. And, okay, uh, I remember. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I got my, I got like two days before graduation, I got my, uh, my assignment. They said, you're going to, Alexandria, Louisiana, on A tens. I was like, right on. What's an A ten? Yeah. I was like, I'm going to the 23rd, though. You know, I'm. I'm that's a good thing. You know, to be. Yeah. Uh, I went to the 74th. Uh, I was blue tail. Uh, went to the 74th. Yeah, a, I was. I was, uh, I was the 75th uh, Tiger Shark guy, but that's all right. You be a 74th guy. <laughs> <laughs> so we were. We. Were, I was pretty proud of that. You know, once I figured out what the A ten was and everything like that, and uh, yeah. getting and the, the, and the history. The, yeah, the history and lineage of the uh, the 23rd uh, fighter group, or it's probably 23rd um, tactical fighter wing at that time, but cut part of tactical air command. Oh, but um, but yeah, 
you know. But yeah, man, so proud. I mean, I'm uh, so proud of yeah. that unit and, and the 511th. You know, the 511th. Yeah, but, but then you, but then you got to end up in Alexandria, Louisiana, it's out in the middle of yes. nowhere. Yes. Yes. So uh, here I am, young kid. I'm 18 years old, Alexandria. And my first thing is, you know, when you, when you get there, you're like, okay, put in a dream sheet, you know, to get out of here. <laughs> so right. I put in my dream sheet. I put my dream sheet in and, and thinking, uh, I think I'm going to get out of here. So I called MPC, which is Manny down in San Antonio, uh, every, every week. And they're like, eh, no, you're not yet. You're not hot yet. And I finally get, a call I get I call down there and they go oh yeah this Sergeant Atwood or uh, I was at that time I was an airman first uh they're like uh you're going to Kunsan Korea oh the rock and I was like and at that time we were trying to they were trying to lock in crew chiefs on airframes so I'm thinking okay I'm going to Kunsan it's a 16 base I'm gonna right. get stuck on A10s or I'm gonna get stuck on F16s yeah and uh end up going get my follow on assignment. I put all my, my follow ons to Germany because that's where all the 16s were. Sure. And I think you were a 16 want you, you wanted 16s at one time. Yeah. We all and, did a pilot uh, training back in, back in 1986. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I put all my, all, all my Germany one or bases that I wanted and I get my follow on Alkenberry back on a 10s. How about that? And I was like, okay, that's it. That's good. I can I can take that. The, need, you know? the old needs of the Air Force, right? You know, and I was happy yeah. to go back to Intense and go back yeah. to Barry. And you know what? That's where it all started. You know, where we yeah. the 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 history, the you know, going to the desert and everything like that started. Yeah, man. Yeah. And um, so, OK, so uh, we're going to come back to Alkenberry, of course, and talk a lot about it in the desert. But so uh, so uh, kind of give us uh, the two minutes on what what, what happened after them. <laughs> it's only been 30 uh, you years. Know what? I'll, give, I'll give you I'll tell you, what, it's been 30 years. I'll give you three minutes. I'll go this talk. I, well, shoot, I, I, I went to I left Alkenberry when we shut down in what was that? Ninety two. Yeah. Uh, went to Nellis on uh, to Thunder there at the 57th. Gotcha. And uh, I worked there for about, uh, I was there about six months, got word that they were looking for helicopter crew chiefs. So I had talked to the Manning people over there and they were like, oh, no, no, we got the, we the airframes here. You're going to, you're, you'll stay here if you get, you get the job. Got accepted to the helicopter side of the house, ended up going to Albuquerque, New Mexico <laughs> on uh, 53. Other guards, hey, other guard spot. Yeah. You know, another garden spot. And uh, I did that for about three years. I just did just shy of 10 years in the Air Force. All right. Okay. And uh, at that time, I was getting back into my flying, you know, trying to, you know, make everything work and everything like that. The, then the BSI, the annual, the, when they paid us all to get out. Yeah. I was like, well, I'm, get, I'm, get, I'm on the list to get out. So. I'm going to flight school. So cool. I get out, I go to flight school and went to Georgia for nine months and finished all my flying down there. And uh, what I do now is I'm, I'm not, a corporate pilot for a, for a family here in Midland, Texas. <laughs> that's awesome. You fly, fly in a citation, right? Citation Encore, single pilot. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's really awesome. So, and, and, and between now, between now and between uh, then and now, so you, so in nine months you went through what you got all the way through ATP. Uh, well, I did all, I did all the way through my, uh, at, in, after I left the air force, I did everything up to my, uh, multi-engine instructor. And, okay. um, uh, I went, so you went through did, commercial did you and then multi-engine instructor. Yeah. Yeah. CFI, double I, M E I, uh, yeah. Got all that done, and then went to. I, I went ahead and did the instructing phase for about three years, and just built time. built hours up, and built my time up. And then I've just been doing charter air ambulance. I've been flying medevac for about fifteen years. Yeah, uh, and, and a bunch of bunch of different airplanes: Conquest, uh, King Air, uh, also Conquest, Citation. King I Air, yeah. uh, Pilatus, PC, Pilatus, PC, yeah, PC nine, twelve. 
12? Yeah. 12? The 12, yeah, the 12, that's right. The designs, the yeah. little uh, little sports car uh, in, insurgent airplane, yeah. Um, yeah, the 12. I've flown the 12 some as well. That's a cool airplane. I like that. We talked about that on the phone recently. Um, now, but somebody in close to you wasn't so fond of the PC-12. Why was that? Ooh. Oh, my wife? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, <laughs> she, she wasn't. She wasn't Where that was, fond of the single single engine, right? No, she's not too fond of the single engine. And uh, uh, you know, actually, uh, I came down to. Uh, I was up flying corporate out of uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, for a company out of Phoenix, for a medical uh, group down there. And uh, I ended up taking the job down in Amarillo, and uh, got down. I, I took the job specifically for the PC twelve. And the, the day before my check ride, they took the airplane out, uh, flew the airplane, and it crashed, killed three people. Oh, wow. So okay. I ended up going, that's how I ended up in the, con I, that's how I ended up in the Conquest. And I flew the Conquest for about two years. Then we got the two, uh, King Air 200 GT that we flew for about two years. And then uh, I ended up going to, uh, Ended up going to actually, I left Amarillo, went down to Laughlin to be a sim instructor for the Air Force in the T6s. Oh, no kidding. How about that? And, I didn't know that. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I did that for a little bit. And then uh, I got a call from a buddy of mine that was the area manager for uh, Air Miss down in uh, Carlsbad, New Mexico, flying the PC 12. He says, Hey, I need a pilot. Come fly for me. The job's yours. So I was like, Okay, I'm going, <laughs> you know. I'm in the PC-12 now, and uh, it's a it's a good airplane. It's a tough airplane. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah, a you know, I, yeah, I love the PC-12. I've flown it a couple times as well. Just a couple ferry flights, I think, between here and Tulsa, and I think down to Wichita once. But, yeah, it's cool. It'll glide forever as well. And, by the way, if, if, oh, Pilatus, is a, yeah. if Pilatus owns any part of YouTube, and I don't demonetize my show, uh, it's a great airplane. We love Pilatus. Uh, and uh, we're just, you know, wives don't often love single engine airplanes just because, you know, two engines sound safer than one engine. But that PC-12 will glide oh, yeah. forever, land about anywhere. It's an awesome airplane, huge cargo door. You put a, put all kinds of stuff in it. That'd be great for air ambulance with that kind of access. Especially for the medevac world. The medevac world yeah. is great. Oh, you yeah. know, you could just, you just, you got tons of room to get. I mean, in the King Air, you got a, a very narrow door of about 24 inches. So if yeah. you have a very big person, it's hard to get them in there. Yeah. Um, I mean, that that PC-12's got the, that, that door. You can put a pallet in there. I mean, it's awesome. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can, yeah. You can load it up. Things pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's cool, man. And, and um, I've been, I'm going to say, you know, since I'm slightly older than you, that, man, I'm proud of you, man. I mean, it's, it's awesome to go from, from, um, you know, bed and wrenches on airplanes to fly in airplanes is, is really cool. It's a cool, cool evolution. And uh, now you've been flying longer than I have because it's been a while since I've flown. Uh, but uh, uh, man, you've flown all kinds of cool airplanes and now you're living the dream. I'm, I'm thinking flying, flying a Citation it's, Encore. It's, it's, it was one of those things at the time when I did it, you know, everybody said you can't do it. You're, you're, you're not, you're, I, I mean, I had, I had pilots that were like, Oh no, they're never going to pilot, you know, air yeah, force pilots. You know, they're like, well, we can't even get jobs out there. And I was like, you know what? Never say never. Just do there it. you go. Yeah. And yeah. I follow, I follow, follow this guy, follow this guy, um, CW Lemoyne mover. And, um, and he, he's got a huge channel, about 400,000 subscribers. I think it's about 425,000 actually now, but, but, um, and it, he just started with this thing called make them tell, you no, uh, kind of to inspire young people to get into aviation, especially military aviation. And, you know, those people that say, oh, you'll never do it. People told him that he was at, I think he was, um, at the university level and, and, uh, talk, you know, in ROTC and they said, Oh, you'll, you're not, you're not smart enough to be a pilot. Well, he, guess what? He ended up flying F-16s in the air force and F-18s in the Navy. So there, it, you know, and got a helicopter, yeah. uh, commercial rating and, and, uh, flown all kinds of cool stuff. So, um, a reserve airline pilot now, uh, uh so, uh, or I think he's on, um, on, uh, I think it's reserve status, or whatever. So kind of the, the, um, um, I think that's what they call it reserve. So he's not, not actively flying for a major airline now, but he has. So, yeah. And, you know, and, and, and here he was a college student, people telling him no. And he did what you did. He started calling around and, and you know, just trying to make his, make his, uh, make his own fortunes. Um, and um, so 
yeah, those people that are going to tell you, oh, you can't do it, you'll never do it, or you're too old to do it, or whatever, um, to say, you know, uh, I'm going I'm to try yeah, yeah, anyway. When I, when I got in the Air Force, you know, you know, that was back in the day when you couldn't wear glasses. Yeah, you know? right. They were like, oh, no, 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 you wear glasses, you you can't, you'll, you know, until you got into flight yeah. school, and then if you got glasses, then it was okay. Right, uh, exactly. <laughs> and I've, I've always worn glasses since I was about 18. So, yeah. you know, I just went ahead, went my, my, my private route. Sure. And, uh, yeah, well, well, and I, and now I know you're, you're too humble to say, but, but I know you've got people calling you, offering you jobs, you know, wanting you to come fly for them. So, uh, you know, oh, not only it's, say, it's, like people saying, oh, you can't do it. And now people are saying, hey, hey, will you come do it for me? Which is, uh, which is really awesome. Hey, we've got some, um, we've got some folks in the chat which you might recognize, like this guy right here. <laughs> Michael Irish O'Connor, who says he's my man because Scott was his crew chief on 157. We're going to talk more about that. Here's another guy. Here's, here's another guy you might know. Another O'Connor. The O'Connors are ubiquitous. Colin. So there's Colin. Yeah, we talked to him last week as well. Um, he's called, He likes to call everybody old. He just turned 40, so I guess that makes us old. So, I don't know. so yeah. Hey, here's, here's a good question, too. I'm going to put this one up because um, it's a good question. So, uh, Zenith, hey, thanks, Zenith, for uh, being on the on the the, uh, the live chat. Wonder if they sent him back to boot camp after every move. <laughs> yeah, so, well, you, you you did boot camp for the for the Army Reserve, I'm sure, and then you probably did boot camp for the Air Force too, didn't you? Well, I was I was a special I was a special one for the Air Force because I did I I did my full basic for uh, I did, went to Fort Knox for the Army, did my eight weeks there, um, okay. and then when I went to the Army. To do the Air Force, I'm sorry. Um, you know, you get in. You normally get in there at two o'clock in the morning. You know, you're you're a dumb kid. You don't know what you're doing and everything like that. And uh, they ask, they ask, uh, do we have any prior service people in here? Oh, really? And I was, I was gonna be dumb. I was, I was gonna play dumb. I was like, I, I don't, you know, I'm just gonna do the whole thing and just do my, do my time and get on out. And. Yeah. Uh, I looked over. There was one guy that was uh, he was a Marine, and there's another guy that was a Civil Air Patrol guy. And then myself, I raised my hand. I was like, "I'm Army. I'm Army," you know. And uh, they're like, "All right, you three over there." We we became what was called a proficiency advancement at Lackland. Oh, okay, cool. So I didn't know they had. That. Uh, we had, I we were on our own track. We we did our own little thing. We went we went and did all our work and everything on our own. We didn't do the whole basic training thing. Uh, okay. The Marine, <clears throat> if we if, if you're a PA, you were only there two weeks. So okay. um, the Marine didn't make it. He got set back. No and kidding. Civil old guy got set back, wow. and <clears throat> I made it through. Next thing I know, is I'm on my, I'm on a bus to Shepherd. Texas. Yeah. So when, okay. When were you, when were you at Lackland? Do you remember what year? Uh, what that was? would have been 80. That would have been 86, 85, into Summer. 85, 86. Yeah. Okay. So you were, you were just ahead of me. I was at Medina base for OTS in, um, I reported at the end of July in 86. So how about that? So, so there, yeah, I was, we're... I was there July through October and then I went to Shepherd. and I was there Shep, at Shepherd from, um, late October, of 86 through um through about january of um, well december of 87 so yeah so we were we were at we were at shepherd at the same time same time yeah there we go yeah i was i was fine i was uh, waddling around in t-37s you were better wrenches in yeah. the hangers of the t-37s now they got the t-6s up there and uh yeah the t-38s T thirty eight charlie yeah the t thirty eight charlie yeah I, I was flying the white white t-37s and white t-38 alphas Yep, it's awesome. So, uh, good days, good days. <laughs> so, Shepherd America. Yeah. Here's a, here's some here's another um, here's another comment from the uh, from the chat. PC twelve is a good plane, but I prefer the TBM. Yeah, TBM is an awesome plane as well. PC twelve I think is a little 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 larger, probably a little more cargo yeah. capability in the PC twelve. But um, Rebel, if you've got a TBM, I'll come fly it. Just let me know anytime. I'll be there. This is awesome awesome uh, airplane. I'll be right there with you. <laughs> here's another Mike. Mike, here's another Irish O'Connor trying to get Pat. Pat, Pat is his, his awesome, uh, awesome wife, the um, first lady of the Vultures. 
the best yes, squadron commander yeah. wife ever. Yeah, uh, and it, that's comes from the from the wives themselves. Uh, she's Pat O'Connor was the best there is as a uh, as a combat first lady, for sure. So, um, and um, and uh, even okay. So see, I'm not the only dumb one. Even the boss had never heard of proficiency advancement. I think that's something they made up for you because you're so darn smart, man. So you'd be pro well, you know, I didn't, know anything, I didn't know anything about it until I got, yeah. You know, and yeah, that's cool. It, yeah, there was no proficiency was just, advancement was, at OTS. I was just going to play dumb and say, you know what? I don't know anything. You know, I'm just, I mean, I'm just here to be in the air force, you know? Yeah, man. So um, let's, uh, let's fast forward to Alkenberry. Cause that's, that's what I think we, we want to talk about the most. So, so uh, yeah. when did you, when did you get to Alkenberry? What, what, what time frame? I got there. I got to Alkenberry. I came to Coons Hall. Uh, yeah. And uh, I got to Alkenberry, uh, actually Christmas week of 89. Okay. Man, you and I, you and I had very, you and I had somewhat parallel, parallel tracks and never knew it till this day, like 40 years later. Cause uh, um, I was at Suwon from um, uh, June of uh, 88 to June of 89. Is that right? No, June of 89 to June of 90. I was at, Kuhn's, I was at Suwon flying OA 10s. And then I came to Alkenberry. So I came to Alkenberry just a few months after you because I, I got there. So I, went, I, I flew into I flew into Kunsan, uh Thanksgiving weekend or Thanksgiving uh, day, basically Thanksgiving day of 88 and flew out on Thanksgiving 89. And okay. then went and straight I, to, I went straight yeah, we to were, uh, Alkenberry. We were about six months behind everywhere. We were six months behind at Lackland. That's, you know, OTS was used at, then was at Medina Base, a sub, sub, sort of an annex of Lackland down at uh, San Antonio. And then I came to Shepherd about six months after you. I was at Suwon six months after you got to Kunsan. Of course, it's a fair fair distance away. <laughs> Kunsan yeah. being way down at the southern tip of uh, the southwest, the tip of uh, of the Korean Peninsula, and Suwon being up uh, just south of Seoul. Um, uh, sort of about 20, 30 miles from Osan, I think, something like that. But um, anyway, um, and then um, I was about six months behind you at Alkenberry, so after Suwon. So yeah. how about that? Yeah. That's cool, man. So so you got I to Alkenberry. I I, well, I did my first uh, – About I was I was at Alkenberry about three months and did our first uh, TDY to Saragossa. Yeah. So I don't know if you were on that one. Yeah, I was on that one. That's cool. So we went to Saragossa on the first one, and then uh, uh, what was it? Uh, it was probably mid uh, ninety when we went to. Uh, did you go to Al? Uh, I mean, uh, did you go to Denmark? I did go to. I did go to Denmark. Yep. Yeah, I was on that uh, one. Yeah, yeah. I was on that one. Honestly. So yeah. uh, <laughs> we all laughed. I laughed because uh, everybody. They, I came in work one day, and they were like. Oh crap! We lost our air support to Denmark. You have to rail and sail. And I don't know if you were, if you were on the boat going across, or if you flew the I was airplanes on the, over. I was, on, I was on the boat. I flew the airplanes over, and it was on the the, um, the very infamous boat trip coming back because there was a big <laughs> storm, big ass storm in the North Sea. I think there was maybe six of us pilots. I think Buck Windham was was with this deal on this deal with me as well. Pretty sure he was. <clears throat> um, so I flew a jet over, and so. Um, just for the kids at home, typically uh, when a squadron deploys, the squadron's got 18 jets. We probably, I don't know, what do we take? Maybe 12 or something over there, Scott? I don't know. We yeah, we take, take them all. Yeah. yeah, about 12 jets. So if we're taking 12 jets, we're taking probably 20, 24 pilots maybe. So we're taking some wing support staff, et cetera. And, and, it, and especially, especially Denmark, that was a good, real good deal. So. Um, that was a great trip. Anyway, it was a great trip. Yeah, it was a, that, that was that was an epic trip. <laughs> I believe that's a trip where Disco might have gotten his call sign actually, but that's another story for another. another and actually, if you remember the, the last day there when we had the barbecue in the hangar with the Germans yeah. and the Danes. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we we had a little party with the with the Germans and the Danes a little a little before that <laughs> in the parking lot of the, uh, <laughs> of, the of the hotel. I think one of the first nights. Uh, yeah, I won't say how Disco got his call sign. I think he, I think he might, might have retired like a three star or something. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but but he's got his call sign in a, in a in an awesome way at that at that that uh, 
the parking lot of that hotel, but that's another story for another time over some adult beverages. But um, yeah, that was a good deal. So anyway, I was saying we'll, we'll take take usually maybe you know twice as many pilots as as we take jets, or you know certainly at excess. So so of course the squadron commander and you know ops officer they're going to fly both ways, but but other guys like me, um, I was I was still a first lieutenant at that time. I hadn't been, been on captain yet, um, but. Um, so I flew a jet over, which means I got to come back on the ferry boat, which is a it's a big boat. It's a ship. It was but, a big uh, boat. It was. It was a yeah, big yeah, it was a big ship. But but the North Sea uh, at that time of year, I believe it was fall, can be um, could be quite angry, <laughs> and it was quite angry. In fact, it was so angry that they couldn't even feed us. I mean, the thing was just just pitching and rolling everywhere. And I remember the the um, the uh, like I don't know what they call them the captain's assistant anyway he came and got us pilots and i think they rounded up about eight of us i think something like that and um and, and we got it to go up to the captain's like wheelhouse you know and literally i'm not kidding like waves are breaking over the bow of the ship and crashing into the into the glass in front of the wheelhouse it's just it was unbelievable and so uh and then they took us down below a few decks below into a little theater and we watched the hunt for Red October, in, 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 you know, like below the waterline in the in the pitching and rolling North Sea. It was it was quite quite a, quite a good special effect to that uh, that submarine movie. But anyway, um, that, that was a good trip. Um, and um, uh, there was a there was a deployment to Alhorn. Were you? Did you? Did, did I you never went to Alhorn. I never okay. did. I never did. Yeah. Well, well, what I'm going to say is it's, it's what. Uh, what uh, Irish said last week is that, you know, um, the the five eleventh getting the nod to go to the desert out of the six squadrons of A-10s that were in England at the time, four over at Bentwaters, and uh, yeah. the five oh ninth and the five eleventh at Alcamary. Yeah, we were the we were the only squadron um, from Europe to go to uh, the desert, and um, so um, <clears throat> the re and, and 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 really one of the primary reasons for that was the maintenance. Uh, the AMU at the um, uh, at at Alconbury for the 511th was just awesome, and had had pulled off this massive deployment to to Al to Alhorn, you know, supporting getting the jets over there, getting getting spare parts and materials over there, getting all the maintainers over there, and just flying the heck out of the jets uh, during this exercise over there, and then writing this big after action report about how they did it, um, how they you know supplied the airplanes, supported the airplanes. And, and flew them at a very, very high rate uh, throughout this exercise. And that became the sort of the guide, the guidepost for how would we get, you know, 18 A-10s to the desert? Um, because again, as I said last, uh, last program, the mission of, of uh, Alconbury was within about 12 hours um, of, you know, looked like there was going to be hostilities at that time. It was East Germany and West Germany were divided commies on yes. the east and the good guys on the west and so um so the mission was to get over to our forward operating locations like leipheim for instance and um where we had bombs bullets beans and beds you know and we had spare parts and we had people that were stationed there all the time we just get the jets over there and that's where we're going to fight the war from um so there was certainly no plans or or even really thoughts that we would take any of those airplanes and go someplace like Saudi Arabia, for instance, uh, yes. that was the job of the state side squadron. So when you were at Alexandria, you know, you guys would have had wartime plans to do that kind of stuff, to go, uh, to go support that theater of operations. So you'd have your risk kits and your tankers and everything all ready to go. And off you, off you, off the, off they'd go to war. So, uh, and they did within about 18 hours of Saddam Hussein invading Kuwait. Um, August of 1990, uh, the Myrtle Beach guys were were I think they deployed into um, um, they went into uh, they went up to ba not Bahrain it was north of there but anyway they they went in a little bit King north of, of King, King what's that King Fod, King Fod. well they didn't go to they, they actually didn't go to King Fod initially they went to um, they went to where the, they went to uh, Jubail is actually where they where they landed oh, okay. first. Yeah, they went to Jubail. They were there for for a short time, and then and then they decided decided to bed down all the A10s at King at King Fod. So, yeah, but uh, so the Alex guys would have. Uh, when I say Alex, I'm talking about um, Alexandria, Louisiana. 
what was the name of that base for real? <laughs> it was uh, England Air uh, Force Base. England, England yeah, Force in, 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 yeah, England Air Force Base in Alexandria, Louisiana. They just call it Alex a lot of times. The guys did so. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. So um, that's where the 23rd wing was, and and so um, anyway, um, the uh, in in the desert was the 354th Tactical Fighter Wing Provisional, which actually had two wing commanders: the wing commander from the 354th, Colonel Sandy Sharp, and the cur the wing yes. commander from the 23rd uh, fighter group as well was there. So uh, Colonel uh, Dave Sawyer. So uh, those were the two wing commanders uh, for the 354th provisional wing, which included elements of the 354th, the 23rd, the uh, nine, I think it was 926 was the uh, Cajuns, the reserve squadron from New Orleans. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Davis month and the 23rd tactical air support squadron with the OA tens. Uh, was there, yep. and then of course the last in and last out <laughs> were the uh, the mighty vultures, the 511 fire squadron from RAF Alkenberry, the 10th tactical fighter wing. So, yeah. So, oh, so it was really uh, maintenance that that probably made the difference in who got picked out of those six uh, Eng England squadrons, European squadrons, to go to the desert. Uh, when did you uh, deploy over, Scott? I. Uh... Actually, I deployed, or I got into, I got into Saudi, I got the King Fahd Christmas Eve night. So, okay. Yeah. Um, I think that was, I don't know if you went over to, I think you guys came over with the aircraft uh, about two weeks later. Yeah, it was actually, and, here's, uh, I've got, I've actually got the, um, the Desert Storm, Desert Shield, the unclassified log right here. And it, this is from. This is from um, kind of the after action report that I wrote, but this is, this is, you can even tell, this is from the kind of paper that came in a big box and it had like, it had like, you know, ring, circles on both sides that you ripped off because it went, yeah. that's how it went through, yeah. that's how it went through the printer back then. We had like one, com one computer in the squadron back at that time. But um, yeah, um, <coughs> let's see. Um, Advon team, let's see, here we go. Um, 27 December. In three waves, sorry, in 0800. That's when the jets uh, lifted off. Um, okay. Bah, 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 yep. And we went to Siganella, and then uh, yep. the 28th, we uh, the 28th of December, we uh, rolled into to uh, King Pod. So, um, well, I was yeah. actually because uh, you know, I mean, before we, I mean, I think we were supposed to deploy roughly around Thanksgiving on the first notice. And yeah, we nice. were like, okay, we're going, we're not going, we're going. And we all lived in the bag. And I mean, I had five Mo bags sitting in my kitchen that I yeah. was pulling you know, clothes out of, you know, uniforms. And, uh, and then I was, uh, it was probably the 20th, it was the 20th or so of December. I was in a hydraulic class for uh, the A-10. And they came running over and said, hey, we're done. We're, go we're we're leaving. We're going to the desert. Yeah. And that was about the 22nd or 21st. And I was, uh, I don't know if I, I don't know how I, I became the, the, the tank transfer guru on when we hung all our tanks, doing all the yeah. transfer checks. Yeah, right. They, we need you. We, we're going to do, we're going to do, we're going to finish this course out 12 hour days. And then you're going to go back to the unit and, we're going to do the transfer. Yeah. So I did all the transfers like almost in like a day and a half. To, we, we got we, all the tanks on. We flew over with one, didn't we? We just had one tank. Uh, I think we had two. I think we took two tanks. I can't remember. But, but so the boss will, the boss will, wait, the boss will weigh in here and let us know for sure. But yeah. Oh, because the water. What do you say? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, because of the wartime commitment to the NATO theater. Yeah, exactly. That's what that's what we were we were designed. That's what um, those guys were designed for. Um, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to that story. But here's another great guy, man. This guy is a great friend of mine, Joey. He is um, he is. By the way, if anybody's listening that uh, needs a great pilot in their fighter squadron in the Guard or Reserve, this is your guy right here. Um, Scott, how often did you get? the jet back after a sortie and have to ask Irish, what the hell did you do to it? We're going to talk about that, Joey. That's a great lead in. Yeah, I, 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 got a good, I got a good story on that one. And, yeah, man, we're going yeah. to talk about that. So, so, so you got over there um, to FOD and um, 
uh, we got over there with all the jets, all the tanks worked fine. Good job, man. Awesome. And um, we, we are on in Siganella, but um, of course it was a city when you got there. I mean, they'd, they'd been there for quite a while. Um, well, no, when, when we got you... there, we, when we got the, when we got the FOD, they told us, okay, there's the tents. Yeah. Drop your bags. And we started filling sand, sandbags. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it was a city. It was a city that was not ready for us because, you know, we didn't no, get the nod no, no. to come until uh, way late. And so, yeah, you guys got there. And uh, tell tell me about moving sandbags. There's, I think there's a story about this, right? Oh, oh uh, uh, Chief Corbett. You don't, have to, don't, you don't have to name names, but you can use oh. initials or whatever. But if, <laughs> you can name names if you want. Oh, yeah, we were, is, we, we, were, we were building the AMU out on the flight line. And uh, we, I don't know how many sand, I can't, I can't even tell you how many, a uh, hundred, uh, uh, 70,000 sandbags we filled probably. And we built this nice wall and the chief came and said, ah, no, you got to move it over three inches. <laughs> I remember that. We could, and we were yeah, like, yeah. This is okay. not a joke, by the way. This is not a drill. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to move the sand. We're going to move this entire sandbag wall three inches. So. Wow. Yeah. And I'm guessing I'm guessing Mike you, Irish O'Connor wasn't there yet. <laughs> if he would have been no, there. Uh, you guys weren't there yet. And uh we had we had filled a lot of sandbags. And I still keep in touch today with Chief. You know, he's a he's a great guy. And yeah. love we had, to talk we had a to bunch. Him. Yeah, we had we had we had the best best group, man. It was awesome. I mean, everybody was was awesome. Hey, by the way, your uh, your maintenance boss, uh Bob Ham, is that right? Yes, yep. Yeah, he was an OTS instructor, wasn't he? I don't know. Pretty I don't sure. know. It yeah, yeah he was when I was he was he was the he was the uh, <clears throat> instructor when he was a captain of my sister Miss sister flight at OTS actually. I, really? Uh, I I yeah. When I showed up at Alcabari and, and uh, first time I I heard Bob Ham's voice somewhere whatever. <laughs> yeah, I reminded him of, reminded him of the day that uh that uh so I had um, I had. Uh, been elected or whatever chosen to be at the top three at OTS in the upper class, which meant that I couldn't march with my flight. So I would go to classes with them, but then when they would go to chow and stuff, I couldn't march with them. I had to go. They positioned us around the campus and we had to make sure that everybody was like walking in formation correctly and not looking around and not jet checking on the chow pad and stuff like that. And um, so, but the first day, so I'm wearing my OT Colonel, you know, we, we it's weird because at OTS we had like naval naval shoulder boards. So I got my four big ass stripes on my shoulder board, you know, sitting around like big shot and the uh, first day of class. And uh, so go walk into my flight. So we had like these flight classrooms and then the flight commanders, you know, commission captains, mine, mine um, had come from missiles and, and Captain Ham had come from maintenance, of course. And so they had these offices that, that were kind of abutted each other and then joined the classroom. So, and then had doors out to the hallway. So, and of course, if you're walking down the hallway, you're not supposed to like look into rooms that, that you're not turning into, right? And I just happened, I was running just slightly late and uh, it, which was a privilege of four stripes, but, <laughs> but I was really, I was hustling along and I thought, I guess he was on the phone or something. I thought he said something to me. So I turned and looked and he just, man, he called me on the car. He had me stand at attention from his desk, read me the riot act. And he had a pretty booming voice. He was a, it kind of could be an intimidating dude. Right. And, uh, yeah, he, uh, he dressed me down, man. My first day as an OT colonel at OTS, but, uh, but he was a great maintenance chief and you guys were awesome. He was. You know, the, um, the in-service rates of the A-10s, and you probably know this, of course, in Desert Storm were above 97%. I think ours at, at Alcombury, our 511th was like 98.2 or something like that. Yeah. Um, no, we were, I, yeah. I never I, – I flew – I think I think I was maybe the number one or number two high guy in terms of uh, combat stories. I flew forty. I, I took off forty four times and weathered out four, so I had forty counters. But um, um, I never ever had anything but a code one jet um, on takeoff, except my for my very first mission. And guess what airplane I was flying, buddy? One five seven. I looked it up my logbook. I looked up my logbook right here. Here's my here's my official logbook, and. Um, I don't know if you see it, but but it's got this is a, the combat part of my logbook, and I I looked I looked through, and on all those flights, the only time I flew 157 was January 18th. I flew a 2.3. Um, 
my call sign was Weatherby 65. I was mission number 5065 um, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. I flew it three times that day. My <laughs> first combat mission. So my first combat mission, I took off 157, and I had we were I was sitting alert. Uh, Scott Johnson Sparky was my number two guy. Um, we were like I don't know 30 revetments away. It was ridiculous. And so when we when you'd sit alert, you would um, start everything up check it all out, check all the systems out, and then shut down to just APU power. So you kept all your electronics, INS still, you know, still yeah. aligned and all that yeah. stuff. And um, and then wait for some tasking. But if you'll remember that morning was the morning that we had the SCUD attack, uh, SCUD, you know, SCUD warning. So the first alarm well, read. So well, go ahead. You know, those, those first days, uh, shoot, that was right after the war started, right? Yeah, that was the first. That, that was, was the okay, that was the second morning essentially. I mean, there there had been uh, Colonel O'Connor led the first mission off the place. It yeah. Would have been like the so night before. I was, I, I, mean, was before. I, I, was, I was up at Al Juf at that time. Oh, were you? Okay. Yeah. So I was. Uh, this was the. She's gone out. You've gone out, out to Al Juf to service the jets from that first mission. I was the, the first mission. ones. I was the first three from Alcanberry to go to Al Juf. Okay, gotcha. And. I, uh, you know, because everybody wanted to go to KKMC. They're like, yep. we're but young, dumb kids, you know. Everybody wanted to go north. So everybody volunteered to go to uh, KK. And yeah. I had volunteered to go to KKMC. And my first wife, she was like, don't volunteer for anything stupid, <laughs> you know, <laughs> going north or anything like that. So I kind of backed out. And uh, I think it was, uh, Sergeant Ch uh, Shannon, who was our flight chief at the time, he had come to me right before the war started. This was, oh, golly, a day or a day or two before the war actually kicked off. And he goes, I have, an, I have a favor to ask of you. I need you to go somewhere. I can't tell you where. I can't tell you how long. All I can tell you is you're going to be hot pitting jets hot. We're not pitting yeah. jets. Yeah. And that was Al Jew. And yeah. I was like, oh, okay, good. I'll go. I'll go. Not a problem. So Al next Juf, thing I know, was there. Oh, Al Jew. Oh, yeah. Al Jew was, you know, that when the war kicked off, it was like the, the hot pot, right? And uh, <coughs> I get, we get up there and we, we went for, a, we had seven guys from the beach and then we had three from us. And we get up there and uh, they said they'll tell you <clears throat> they'll tell you where you're at when you get there. And yeah, we let we got a forward operating location. Yeah. We, you know, we didn't even know where we we're going. You know. Um yeah. they said, okay, just go to your tent, pack your bag, don't tell anybody you're going anywhere. It's basically top secret. And you know, for a 20-year-old or a 21-year-old, we were like, oh, cool, we're 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 important people now. And uh, they came and got us about the day before the war started, about two o'clock in the morning. And they said, go meet over in that tent, draw your weapons. They gave us weapons and ammo. And next thing we know, we're at the terminal at King Pod. And it was funny because we go into the terminal area. We had an 06 with us from the beach. I, I don't remember his name. He goes, go in there, tell him you want to get on that airplane. And we did. And we went in and we told them, we said, hey, you must, we're supposed to get on that airplane. That airplane? No, you're not getting on that airplane. And we were just like, okay. So we went back out, talked to 06. He said, one sec, I'll be right back. And he come back about 10 minutes later and he said, enjoy your flight. <laughs> and so we were on a 130, <coughs> going to, we don't know where. They said, when you get there, they'll tell you where you're at. When we landed at Juve, Al Juve there, uh, the ramp went down. They threw our bags off the back. The ramp went up. The airplane taxied out. There we had no there, yeah. Now, the greatest thing was uh, I didn't get to see uh, Colonel O'Connor there, but uh, Colonel Schaefer came in. And uh, when we were the, right after the war started, the first night, the, our yeah. airplane started coming in. We're, we're doing the hot pits. And uh, Colonel Schaefer goes, he looks down and he goes, Scott, do you know where you're at? I go, I have no idea. He pulls me up and he pulls his, 
his map out, his sectional or whatever he was using at that time. Oh. <clears throat> he goes, okay, that's you right there. If you have to run, go that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You were, you were, uh, because, uh, that was every bit as close to the front lines, if not closer than KKMC. <laughs> it, was so... it was, yeah. We were about 60 I mean, miles from Iraq and about 60 miles from Jordan, I think. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, uh, I was. Uh, and so this, and this was the, this was again, this is like day one of the war. So the night yeah. one of the war. So uh, this is before the Cajuns went out there and took over <laughs> Al Juf for the yeah. sled hunting rotations. Yeah. This, so when yeah. I went out to Al Juf, it was, it was, um, Let's see, February 11th or something like that, because I shot down the helicopter on February 15th, and I was flying out of El Juf when I did that. Um, and so, um, uh, and that was when we were rotating out to El Juf. Um, I think we we took two jets from each squadron out there at a time or something like that, and we'd stay for a week. So scud hunting. But you were out there when, you, like you said, C-130 dropped you off on the ramp, took off, and you're looking around going, "This is small, right? There's nothing here." <laughs> no, we sat on the ramp. We sat on the ramp for about six hours. Until okay. Colonel Epperson, if you remember Colonel Epperson from the Guard. Oh, yeah. No, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He finally showed up and he says, you guys are killing me. <laughs> he was like, I wasn't expecting you to like tomorrow or the next day. So we didn't have a place to stay or we had no housing. And uh, did you bet down to the fire station? Huh? Did you bet no, down we to the fire up- station? No, we ended up bedding down in the in the compound, okay. in the comp- uh, one of the compounds that was there, and uh, we got there and uh, we, we our first day there we there's a little Filipino restaurant that was on Al Jupe's airport, and we we're like, oh, we're gonna eat good. This is fried rice, you know, Filipino food. And the next day after the war started, we came in thinking we're gonna go get food. They were gone. They had left. Yeah. They had bugged out. Right. Yeah. And we said, well, what do we do for food? He said, go to that hangar over there. And we walked into this hangar, and it was nothing from floor to ceiling of MREs. Cases. Oh, really? Yeah. And they said, take everything you want. Whatever, how many cases you want, take them. So we lived off of, we lived off of MREs for the first seven, eight days while we were up there. Well, Colonel, 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 uh... <laughs> Colonel Epperson wasn't cooking for you, man. He was. Oh no, he, no, no! He got into he got into the groove when when we started doing scud hunting. He'd had all this stuff flown in from New Orleans because he was like a Creole trained chef or something. And so oh. Colonel F would cook for us, man. We ate like kings <laughs> out of LG. Sorry, sorry to say, bud, but we ate like awesome. Oh, I bet, I bet. February. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, here's, what did, uh, what here's the boss. <laughs> yeah, here's the boss. So yeah, he was telling the story, uh, uh, recounting the story last uh, last week. Um, uh, he and Conley, uh, Major Condon, um, landed at Al Juf. So they went, they took off. Uh, they were the first two off the, the, the patch at King Fod for the war. They went up to KKMC yeah. and refueled, went to, then went to Al Juf and refueled, then went up and hit border uh, radar targets um, up along the, the, uh, the border up there with um, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, so, or, or Iraq and Saudi Arabia. So you, you probably just missed him. Uh, he, he probably landed sometime after him if, if Colonel Schaefer was in a later wave, I think. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, Colonel so, Schaefer, um, yeah. He... <coughs> so, so tell us about tell us about being a a um, a crew chief on the A10 in the desert, pretty you know, pretty austere environment, pretty difficult environment with the with all that blowing sand and you know we had sandstorms to contend with. You guys had super long days i did you ever sleep did you sleep for 40 days man and then um also um oh. you know all the all the weapons loaders coming in just all those systems issues um how did you guys keep those <laughs> jets flying at like 98 percent in service rates um in, a, in an austere environment and what was it like being the crew chief on the boss's jet particularly you know i mean we all came from different worlds basically like, I, I mean, I came from the 23rd, you know, working eight tents. And, you know, when we did all our ICPs, and that was the one thing that was really trying to get everybody into, because, you know, we, we did our ICTs on the ramp style right. at right. England. 
and in the States. But then when we did our ICTs in, in Alconberry, we were doing the shelter. So a lot right. of those yeah, guys, hard, yeah. yeah, we're, we're, we're pulling the jets in, we're doing our loads we're refueling and everything like that. So yeah, let me, let me interrupt know, you and tell you just this to describe to people what Scott's talking about. So ICT is an integrated combat turn. So, right. So I get the nomenclature, right. So what we're yeah. doing there is, is trying to turn the jet. So after it flies a, a mission, a sortie and lands, then to get it turned to fly another one. So, as I said, um, on that first, uh, my first, uh, morning of the war i flew three three missions so i never shut the airplane down between those missions so i flew a mission i'd come back and land at king fog and then go through hot pit refueling so um and then and then hot pit rearming hot rearming and then uh, an intel brief and then off you know another tasking and off you go again now what he's saying is at england air force base what what they would have practiced is doing this out on the ramp so out in the open so the airplanes would flow through um, probably in that order, gas and, and munitions and intel and back off again. And so, um, and, you know, maintenance is working any any minor problems with the jets, maybe swapping somebody to a spare jet. So there's a lot that goes on, but the idea is to get the airplanes back, get them refueled, rearmed, and back up in the, in the, in the air to go fight the enemy some more as quickly as possible. So um, doing those things in, in this sort of a flow through on the ramp, you know, step by step, that's what they what he would have learned at the 23rd uh, fighter wing in Louisiana. <coughs> Excuse me. Scott and I are both over getting over colds, by the way. We live very far apart, so don't read anything into that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but and we, and we, neither of us ever worked on the F-15. These views do not express the views of the DOD or the Air Force. They're just our private views, by the way. That was just a joke about the F-15s. But anyway, um, <laughs> but some people will know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, um, so then, then when he got to Alconberry, we have hardened aircraft shelters. So these are big, domed, big, thick, Kind of, kind of like Quonset huts, but they're big, thick concrete reinforced buildings um, with big, huge doors across them, and they're camouflage painted, and they're 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 spread apart around the base in these sort of little cul-de-sacs and all over the place. So, uh, because now we're in a you know much uh, more of a high threat environment, and so these are to keep the airplanes safe from the enemy bombing us. Um, and so uh, now there there it was a much different process because you're going through these flow through shelters to do these combat turns over in the desert. We're all spread out again. The airplanes are in these revetments, which are kind of like, kind of like um, steel uh, plank steel. sort of kind of, kind of planking, right? It's like steel, steel siding almost. Filled with, with, thick sand. Filled with sand. And it, filled with sand. Yeah. So, so these are, and they're, so they're just walls that are built up between each aircraft. And so, so that if one gets gets you know damaged by a bomb or something or missile or or even a you know some sort of a explosion on the ramp, that it's not going to transfer to all the other airplanes down the road. So uh, when we land now to do the integrated combat turns in the desert, once again we're doing this kind of a flow system. I remember we had the you did you have like big bladders of full of fuel, right? Kind of like dug <laughs> out into yeah, the sand uh, and the. I think I think they were about two hundred fifty gal two hundred fifty thousand gallons in each bladder. I think is what they yeah had. massive yeah these five massive gallons, bladders. bladders. And then yeah. we had a pumping station off of the bladders, and that we would right. run to you guys to the airplane and pump yeah. our gas. So so here they are. It's kind of like a kind of like a NASCAR and IndyCar. Uh, we're flowing through these through these hot pits to refuel, and we're not shutting the engines down. They're pumping us full of full of fuel. So and, and well, that's going on. Usually, um, some intel guy or somebody's plugging into the crew chief's plugging in the airplane, finding out you know is there anything wrong with the jet? Uh, you know everything working okay. Intel would plug in there, get our debrief of of uh, of uh, the situation up in the target area, battle damage, and give us a new threat briefing, um, any information that we needed, and and a new tasking would come through. And so as a pilot, well, they're pumping you full of gas. You're talking to people. You're calling into ops. You're Right on your map, you know, getting ready for the next uh, next mission, and then uh, then I think then we go we'd go uh, fuel and then then weapons. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Well, sometimes you'd go whoever's whoever's full. If you had an open fuel spot, you would go fuel first, then go get weapons or weapons, okay. and then go to fuel. Okay. <coughs> I didn't really so know. it would it I was, was it was just kind of whoever's open, you would go first. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was just doing what you told me to, so <laughs> I don't remember. So, yeah. Yeah. so cool. Um, so um, being being the crew chief for the boss's jet. Now, let me ask you this: Did the boss fly one five seven every time he flew? He did not. I don't know if he flew one five seven. He flew most of the. Time. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a kind of one exception, you know. I did not have a I did not have a, a jet with my name painted on it when we went over to the desert. The reason I didn't was because I was a fairly new guy in the squadron. So, uh, besides like the top three, maybe the flight commanders, um, I think it's just really the top three in the squadron. Um, uh, they're they're always going to have their name painted on a jet, you know. They the day one when when the boss got there, he had his jet his name painted on the jet. Um, the nose art for the jets was a different thing. Um, Let's talk about that for a second. Well, let me, let me back up and say, so So old Shanghai did not have his name painted on the side of a jet because I was a fairly new guy in the squadron. And so there were, you know, first lieutenants that had their names painted on a jet. I was a captain and I did not because I just hadn't been there long enough. Now, after I shot down a helicopter in, in 964, <laughs> they, 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 that was, um, that was uh, Colin Moffat's well, jet, 9 actually. You had Van Diver, but 964 was yeah. Van Diver's airplane, right? Yeah, yeah, and Colin Moffat was the pilot who had the name painted on the side of it, and they had come up with the uh, nose art uh, from the Grateful Dead, "Steal Your Face." So, yeah, I remember yeah, that one. yeah, so yeah, yeah. so uh, eighty-one zero nine six four was "Steal Your Face," and um, that was the one I was flying out at Aljuf when I uh, shot down the helicopter. So then they painted my name on the side of it along with the Iraqi flag, which was cool. But but um, so when the squadron commander is on the schedule. They're going to do whatever they can to give him his jet, right? One five seven. So, um, so and and then you're the crew chief for one five seven. Does that mean you launch it every single time it goes? I was always on my airplane. Yeah, yeah. Unless unless something was going on with my airplane, I had to cover another airplane. Um, and I can I can remember one time and Colonel, uh, refresh my memory if. I believe there was one time you were flying and you lost an engine and had to shut it down. And I was working it that day and I was, I was livid. I was like, Oh my God, I, I heard one five sevens coming out IFE single engine. And I was like, Oh, well, he flew it almost every mission. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And he so what went, through your, what went through your mind? What, what goes through your mind when when uh, you've launched the boss in your jet and he's coming back with an engine problem? What goes through your mind? Oh, you're 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 just like, what did I forget? Did I forget something? Did I do something wrong? You know, as a maintainer, you're like, what did I what did I miss? Did I do something wrong? And yeah. all you want to see is that airplane on the ground. Yeah. And Shoot, it's the same thing flying. I mean, me flying now, you know. Uh, if something yeah, goes you lost, wrong, you, you, you lost an engine, didn't you? Recently, uh, you flew into some somewhere BFE with a had to get an engine swap out or something, didn't you? No, 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 no. I've been lucky. I've never lost an engine in an airplane since I've been flying, and I got about That's eight thousand awesome. hours. And wow. awesome. I've been very lucky, and I've talked to friends that have. Oh, I've lost two or three engines. And I'm like, oh my god, you know, am I doing something wrong? I, I've been, yeah. I've been so lucky. I, I but do, uh, do you remember what the Colonel, problem was with the? Yeah, do you remember what the problem was with his engine that day? I think it was just. I don't. I, was, I don't know if an oil issue or something like that, but. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't, know I, Colonel, I don't know if the Colonel I don't remembers think, that. I don't think he shut it down. I think he he. He contemplated shutting it down, but I, I, as I recall him telling the story last week, he didn't shut it down. But you go back to last week's uh, podcast with um, with Irish O'Connor, and he'll and he tells he tells that story. So, um, but um, what were the days like, man? I mean, you know, you guys, you guys. Did, I mean, it's just awesome. I just can't even say enough how truly amazing maintenance was in the desert. It was such an austere environment, such harsh, you know conditions in terms of just the environmental conditions and then we're just flying the hell out of the airplanes and and, and you know and and getting shot at <laughs> um by the way the 511th was the only squadron not to lose an airplane or have one significantly bad right. damage yeah. either yeah 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 so that's awesome um and, and we had the highest in service rates of anybody so again it's a tribute to maintenance but but um and what were those days like i mean were you guys 12 on 12 off or were you sleeping at all i mean 
I it just <coughs> well, it was, we were twelve. We were twelve on, twelve off. Uh, but we worked at uh, basically the schedule was twelve noon to midnight. Is the way we 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 weren't working like a, a full day shift. So like some were getting mornings and afternoons, or morning or early mornings and then into the evening, and then we would yeah. come in, vice versa. You know, yeah. so we weren't. We weren't right hammered with either you know if you're on day shift you're getting hammered with the heat or if you remember those days you know after you know 10 11 12 o'clock it got cold yeah uh, absolutely yeah i, I describe it like this the desert's kind of like a blast furnace it's just when the sun comes up over the horizon it's like a blast furnace turning <clears> on <throat> and it's just crazy hot all at once especially you know we were there of course the war was was um you know in the winter months there winter um but we didn't yeah. go home until like late june or something early july so yeah. um, it, it got got very much summer <laughs> but uh yeah so it's just when the sun comes up the horizon it's like a blast furnace turns on and it's just it's just crazy hot you know um all the time and then and then when the sun goes down at night it is it gets, it gets surprisingly cold. cool um which seems cold <laughs> because it's been 100 plus 100 maybe 120 maybe i think it got up to maybe like 140 or something one couple of days but and, and we had some yeah. sand we had some sandstorms too right i mean yeah uh, we did some big ass yeah. big sandstorms come through there as well um how did you guys protect like the 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 eo uh sensors like uh, like the the pay penny pod and the the uh you know the the maverick missile uh seeker heads would how would you protect well, all, the, from the, from the sand? They, all the pigs had covers that we would put yeah. on and then I know, I know for, I think why we were there, like our compre our compression, compression washes that we used to do on the engines went down because of the, the, the sand was so fine that it yeah. was actually cleaning the engine. Oh, as, yeah. As, yeah. And that's the thing yeah. is that the, the, the sand, by the way, for the kids at home, is like talcum powder over there. It's a really it fine... Is. Fine, fine, fine sand. It's not. It's not like beach sand that you think of or desert sand in the Southwest United States. It's just very, very fine, soft sand. But it's um, so which means it blows like crazy. And and, and uh, uh, when there's sandstorms, it's just like like the whole sky and the whole horizon is just this 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 cloud of dust. It's it's amazing. Um, and when it moves through, it moves through with ferocious wind and um, and velocity and so you know it can pit the like the like glass and the seeker heads of 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 things like like um, maverick missiles for maverick. instance so yeah uh, i can't remember if it cover for the mavericks uh, uh yeah my understanding is they they use some um something like akin to a pantyhose i think so some kind of a nylon thing that stretched over them to protect them uh, they weren't on there very long we'd send them up north <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, yeah. we shot shot up we shot a shit to the mavericks for sure but yeah um here here we go here's the, here's the boss's uh this is awesome man we should have just we should have just podcasted him in for three shows, oh yeah but, okay. erratic oil pressure. Erratic oil pressure never had to shut it down that's what i thought so so see okay. Just, uh, okay. what, and it wasn't it wasn't scott's fault either it was just but 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 i <laughs> but i but i knew i knew i knew from talking to you um that you um um uh you know, take that more personally, even when it's the boss. I mean, again, just to be the crew chief on the boss's jet is a big honor, but it's a big responsibility as as well. Um, hey, Rebels back in here with another question. Um, asking um, if Matt, um, Coke. Oh, yeah, I know. I know Coke. Yeah, Coke was a yeah. uh, weapon school. Yeah, he was a weapon school instructor um, when I was a student at the weapon, the A-10 weapon school. Good dude, man. Good dude. He is a, he is a that dude is an awesome tactician in a in a just a kind of a quiet, smart, humble, shit hot fighter pilot. He's a fighter pilot's fighter pilot, man. I have a great respect for Coke for sure. Yep. So um it, I can't remember what he may was he a Myrtle Beach guy or was he an, an Alex guy? I don't remember, but um but yeah, good good dude for sure. Probably end up being a general officer, I don't know. I imagine he did. Um, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll look that up later. Let's see if I had a producer, which I'm working on getting a producer. If I had a producer, I'd say, "Hey, producer, look that up for me." But I don't, so I won't. Um, and um, yeah, so cool. Um, so, what were what's your takeaway from from the desert, man? I mean, 
what to just sum it up for me like what was your experience like overall just in a, in a big picture of of um of that operation as successful as it was um uh, what are your thoughts it was it had to be the best time of my life you know it, it really i mean the people that we worked with the 511th outstanding i mean everybody was top notch yeah and it was such an honor it was such an honor to get selected because we were like 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 you said we were we're the only european unit to go right we're you safety at that time and right i i don't think any of the bentwaters or uh, woodbridge people went and the five or the 509th didn't get selected and yeah. the, the, all uh, us. Yeah, the the bentwaters folks brought a few jets over as spares um, when yeah. uh, some some of the some of not our jets but some of the stateside boys just got shot up because uh, I remember um, um, I remember a couple of those guys coming over there. Um, uh, one of them was that dude that went on to play at the Dallas Cowboys, whose names oh whose yeah, name yeah, is yeah, yeah. You know? But yeah, he brought he brought a jet over, and I remember those guys like lobbying to try to fly. They wanted to fly some combat missions, but by that time we'd already had we'd already had about. 10 or so missions under our belt, you know, each of us. And so it didn't really make any sense to, to rotate new guys in at that point. So they just got to fly spy spares over from Bentwaters and go, go home and, you know, free to marry or whatever. But yeah, but, um, uh, I, I, it was, it was such an honor, you know, and, uh, you know, to be, I, I, I did desert storm. And then like, I, I didn't get to tell you this, but you know, I, I was out 10 years in 2007, I went back in the Army Guard. Worked black yeah, Hawks. perfect, perfect segue, perfect segue, because this is what I was going to ask you about next. So this was not your first, <laughs> this is not your last time to the combat zone. Yeah, tell I, us, I, tell I, us about that. Before. Do what? Tell us about that. So yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I was missing the military, and since I was a helicopter guy, when I cross trained from the A10 over to the 53. I uh, talked to the Army Guard, and they were like, yeah, we could, we'd could. love to have you here because you're a Sikorsky guy and, you know, the aircraft. And then I ended up on Blackhawks and not knowing that we were going to end up going to Iraq for a year towards the end. And uh, they they asked everybody who, want, who wants to go, and we all raised our hands, and we're off to Iraq. And so 2010, 2011 was the end of Iraq for us. Uh, right. So I spent uh, a year in Taji, Iraq, just north of Baghdad. All right, that's where you were. How about that? Yeah. I mean, isn't that isn't that something, man? I mean, so twenty, you know, nineteen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty years later, um, you're you're just north of the of what twenty years ago was the most heavily defended city in the world, and um, yeah. where we were where, where we were headed, um, where your jets were headed uh, off we the ramp. Just, and fire. Our jets were just over there, and yeah. that's a, that's amazing. Yeah. And I, yeah. Now I'm I'm just you know, 2010. Here I am, right 20 miles north of Baghdad. That's something. That's just that's just amazing. And you were there for a year that time. I was there a year. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's a long deployment, man. I mean, so, um, uh, and I'm sure totally different than 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 being at FOD, but um, and, and as you say, you know, later days of of our experience in Iraq, but but um, still, you had, you're you're up there with a with an unknown sort of 360 degree threat, right? I mean, it's a little tough to know who the good guys are and the bad guys are off base. Uh, you probably didn't go off base. Well, yeah, we, I mean, we got our, our, we, we got bombed a lot. I mean, let alone, we got bombed with the skids in the, in uh, key fog. Yeah. Uh, but in Iraq, I mean, <clears throat> they had the, uh, you know, we, we, we'd call them drive-bys. Basically, because you'd have a bunch of guys drive by outside the wire, because we never went outside what we call the wire in okay. in Iraq, and they would shoot mortars at us like, oh, right. uh, May fourth, May fourth, two thousand eleven, we got hit with eighty over eight. They stopped at eighty. They stopped counting at eighty. We had eighty mortars fired at us in three less than three minutes. Wow, wow, and. Uh, wow. You know, and I, 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 you know, I hate to say it, but the army guys didn't like me too much. I don't think because I was an air force guy originally. <laughs> so they were like, Oh, you're an air force guy. You know, what are you doing here? You know? Yeah. Well, so, it's just, it's just, 
Just see friendly <laughs> inter-service rivalry there. They, they were jealous because in your first war, you had better living conditions than them, although not, not, not tremendously. Hey, no, and, and that, was a, that was a wonderful news. I mean, we had, in our unit, we had a lot of Marines, former Marines, a lot of Navy guys, a lot of Air Force guys. Yeah. Um, so, so everybody kids, everybody kids, everybody for their own reason. So, yeah, um, yeah, they remember those the army guys were remembering that it's some like reforger or something you were seeing in a nice hotel and they were out in a tent. So that's what they're, yeah, of used to for. yeah, but uh, that's cool, man. So, um, the uh, very different type, and, and this is one thing I want to say too, you know, because as Scott's alluded to it in you know, two different times that you know, putting up his hand to say, man, I want to go, I'm excited to go, want to be there, and it's not that that any of us want a war to happen. But if there is one happening, you want to be in on it because it's what you are. It's what a warrior is. And that's, that's why that's what I was going to say is, you know, Scott's a real warrior. The warrior is the one that, that puts up his hand and says, yeah, coach, put me in, send me that, that, un, that classified place out somewhere. I don't know on some airplane that takes an 06 to get me on with a weapon and ammo and everything. Cause, uh, cause that's the place I want to go. And, uh, um, you know, I was, I was excited to go to Desert Storm, Desert Shield. We all were. It was an honor. But beyond that, it's what we trained to do. And um, and so if there's going to be a shooting war and you're trained to be part of a shooting war, you want to go to the shooting war. It's like the Super Bowl. You hope it doesn't happen. We were all hoping and praying right up till, you know, the President H.W. Uh, Bush made his speech to the nation that um, you know, that it's like peace talks are over, and and um, we're, this coalition's going to have to have to go to war uh, to eject Saddam Hussein and his third largest army in the world out of Kuwait, and so that's what we did, and so uh, and then once again, you know, Scott uh, raised his hand and went to Iraq. Um, uh, in a in a much different war 20 years later with a different service, and uh, that's a true warrior, man, and uh, and I salute you. And uh, Thank you. Pre appreciate appreciate your willingness to do that. And so, so how many years yeah. total did you serve then? I did Between seventeen. The I did seventeen, 17. altogether. Yeah. And uh, now yeah. you're living the dream, man. I saw. I've yeah. said, I, I'm going to have to. My next podcast, I'm going to figure out how to like put up pictures along with our with our videos here. But but I was I was perusing your Facebook today, and uh, and I'm seeing like luxury cars and citation. You know, encore jets <laughs> back behind him, and like these beautiful scenic locations going right on. Man, this guy's living the dream. It's awesome. That it is so cool. And now, tell me about large, large reptiles, though. I've seen a couple of other pictures where you have like a oh. like a snake, like like twice as big as you are. Yeah, like, I, have a, I have. A, I have about a. Uh, she, she's about her, her. Her name is Fifi. She's about a six foot red tail boa, and uh, she's a sweetheart. She's a sweetheart. She's, a, she's a the big, most calmest thing. It's a big ass snake, man. <laughs> it's she's getting big. Uh, she was only about three feet when I got her. And wow. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what to do with her for her next enclosure because she's getting too big for this one. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's what that, uh, I'm guessing. It, I was thinking about that because I see, you had pictures of you like holding her up, and I'm thinking. Man, that snake's got to have like its own room or something. Yeah. Like, like, what do you? Almost. Like, what almost, is it? Almost. What what does a boa constrictor eat? Anything uh, we, anything it wants, I guess. We feed her a large rat every month. That's all she eats. That's she it. Eats once a month. Yeah, yeah. No kidding. Huh. And then I have another one. My little one is about three feet long, and she, she, he eats about he eats a medium rat once a week or once a month. Huh. So that's good. No kidding. Uh, I don't I don't do what they they what they call power feeding. If you power feed them, which is like once a week, then they grow a lot faster and get bigger. Uh, so we do once a month. She's fine. She loves it. She's been doing that forever. And hmm. she's just, a, she just, she's right now, she's in her, in her enclosure and just laying out under the sun <laughs> or under the heat lamp. Well, next, next time you need to have a Fifi cam because that sounds pretty cool. It yeah, sounds interesting. Yeah. But, but you know what? Um, I was going to tell you, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing, like what we all did, you know, for us young guys, uh, you know, we all looked up to you guys. We're like, ah, oh, you guys are A-10 pilots, man. And, and being an A-10 pilot, I'm, there, there's nothing, there, there's nothing more than we look at, you know, it's, it's the greatest thing, but we all trained, you know, for all these, you know, especially when we were in England, you know, at the 23rd, 
You know, yeah. we're doing these ICTs and all these training sorties and surgeons yeah. and everything like that. It's like, now we're going to the desert. Let's, now we get to put everything we did in practice. Yeah. You know, that, and that's what, I think, I think that's what everybody was excited about is that we, not that we're going to war, but we get to instill what we learned and trained and practiced and did for so many years. And yeah. I know there's a lot of guys out there that are like, oh man, I wish I would have went to the desert, you know, and didn't have the opportunity. And we all got the chance to do it, to do what we do, you know, keep yeah. you guys safe. That's right. Fix it. Yeah. And that's and, right, man. And, and, you know, for, for us as pilots, first of all, thank you for your, for your kind words. And, you know, we weren't much older than you, man. I was, I was 25. So, so you know, I was a young, young kid as well, but um, yeah. And, you know, and, and I'll say this too, um, because I didn't have a jet with my name on it um, out there. Um, I wasn't, you know, super close to a crew chief um, like, like you and the boss, for instance, uh, like the relationship that you have. And, um, um, and I really didn't, I, I wish I would have spent more time with maintenance actually, you know, I wish I would have been the guy that, that sort of got to know a crew chief and, 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 and went out and bothered him a few times on the flight line, you know, and learned to learn a little bit more about the systems and stuff. But I never over G jet. So I never had to go do that, that inspection with a, with a, with the crew chief. But, um, but, um, well, I might've over G jet, but we had a button we could push. <laughs> to reset the thing. <laughs> that is a joke by the way. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so, um, but, um, but man, I, I'm going to, I'm going to say this. So, you know, when we went up to war, I mean, at least I'll say for myself, you know, uh, again, like you alluded to, we, we, we fight the way we train, you know, so, so, um, so we want to train like we're going to fight because we're going to end up fighting the way that we're trained to do. And, and, uh, and so, um, I'm sure, you know, the, the, the precision, the, the, uh, the expertise that you guys showed, uh, on, you know, every single day um, in training <coughs> was exactly what we got in combat, except for, guess what? It was even better because the in-service rates of the A-10s in combat were greater than any ORE that I ever was part of anyway, you know, any surge that oh, yeah. I was part of. Remember, remember, in fact, in fact, you were part of this, man. Um like every A-10 in the world came out to England Air Force Base one time. It would have been, um, yeah, let's see. I should look at my logbook because I could tell. But it would have been, um, I was at DM. I was flying the, the 23rd TAS. It was the first exercise that I ever went to. There was like, there was like you know, flag rank officers there because this was the thing where we're going to like see how many times we can fly the jets, you know, and shoot the gun out every time at the points at range wherever we're going. And um, you remember this exercise? It was a really big, huge exercise. Everybody descended on, on um, England Air Force Base. And it would have been, um, let's see, it would have been in 80, 88 sometime. Like would have been like, like, like probably would have been probably um, late 88, uh, late 88, 89. No, it would have been late 87, early 88, something like that. Um, yeah. big, huge deal. Cause, um, what we decided at the 23rd task was we were just going to take a, just a, a flight, one of our flights. So, um, I was in B flight. My flight commander was Mark nasty habits and, um, uh, captain. And, um, he was, his home was in, was Alexandria, Louisiana. His father had a rice field, like rice farm, not, not too far outside the base there. So, um, and so, B flight got the nod. And so they treated it just like we would a wartime uh, commitment. I think we got like 24 hours notice to go and pack our bags. And then boom, off we went uh, as a flight to, to, uh, to this big exercise at England Air Force Base. It's my first exercise, my first, you know, deployment of any kind, um, fairly new out of the B course uh, in the, uh, and then the, the OA-10 spin up. So, so there I am. And, um, and this was a huge deal. They went through like every car at the motor pool, Every car on base that could be given away to an officer, you know, generally they'd, they'd give officers cars um, and, you know, you'd get like three or four guys to a car. But so it came down to like me and another lieutenant. Um, by the way, this guy, I'll just use his call sign, Mongo. Uh, 
Good dude, man. In fact, he just he just became one of the highest time guys in the F-16. So he flew the OA-10, and then he went on to fly the F-16. And he just went over like uh, 5,000 hours, I think, in the F-16 out at Nellis. But anyway, um, awesome dude. Um, and um, uh, anyway, went to Korea with me in the in the OA-10 as well. But, but so here we are, uh, two brand new lieutenants. I mean, we're barely like first lieutenants. And uh, they give us an EOD truck, man, like the big four pack with the like sirens, lights and sirens and the flip, the flip thing for all the like, you know, explosive ordnance and the chemicals and all that stuff is like, OK, whoever thought that giving two brand new fighter pilot lieutenants, the EOD truck with the sirens and the lights, you know, that guy, that guy needed to be fired, too, because we almost yeah. got fired. Because what else do they have, Scott? They have drive through daiquiri huts. They're in, um, yes, they do. Yeah, 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 they yeah, do. You, you can actually drive yep. through and get your daiquiri and be sipping on your daiquiri as you're driving your vehicle. Eh, probably well, not your my, Air Force what, uh, vehicle. My, my career, well, ever since I was in the military, I had never been at a place where I had to be 21 to drink. So when I got to Louisiana... Oh. Yeah. In 88, yeah. the drinking age was 18. And they had daiquiri huts and all the bars downtown, you had to be 18 to drink. And sure. you could, there was no open container law at that time either. So you could drive down the, down, down the road right. and drink a beer and pull up next yeah. to a cop and he wouldn't do anything. He couldn't yeah. do anything. Yeah. Yeah, and, but but what you can't do, but so what you can't do is you cannot take your EOD vehicle off base to the daiquiri hut and then drive through and get your jet <laughs> you get your jet fuel daiquiris. Now, I, I was not driving. First of all, I was sitting shotgun. We did take a captain along, <laughs> C and I captain, uh, call sign Rooster. So you got Rooster, Shanghai, and Mongo, and um, and uh, I'm sitting shotgun. Rooster's driving. Mongo's in the back, and. Um, we are coming back from the daiquiri hut with our jet fuel daiquiris. Now we are not sipping on our daiquiris as far as I'm going to say. Um, we are certainly not intoxicated by any means uh, or, or anywhere close. We are certainly, we are very being very legal. Um, however, some civilians in this little like um, souped up pickup truck, you know, kind of low rider pickup, you know, with the cool graphics, whatever, they decided that they were going to, hassle us a little bit so they're like and we're on that remember there's just like there's this i just remember there's this like long straight two lane road one lane each way lined with like pine trees that came from wherever we went to get daiquiris at the daiquiri up back to base and so we're on this the, long straight road back gate. You remember you're coming through the back yeah. gate <laughs> well yeah because because we're in an eod truck with daiquiris man of course we're coming to the back gate we're not we're not stupid we're just lieutenants <laughs> but so yeah that back gate uh, road and these guys pull up beside us and they're like honking their horn. They're flipping us off or whatever. And then they chunked a beer bottle at the truck. So Rooster, being a captain and all, he says, Shanghai, fire extinguisher. Because guess what? In an EOD truck on that big hump in the middle, there's a big ass foam fire extinguisher right there. <laughs> so, you know, strapped in. So uh, so he like slams on the brakes, maneuvers back high, back behind him because they came up. They came up uh, on our driver's side. So now he gets, he gets up on their driver's side. So that's, you know, my passenger window. So I rolled down the window, the crank window, and I got the, the and rooster says, fire extinguisher, I know what to do with that. So out the window, I just hose the hell out of their whole windshield, man. And they're like, whoa, and they're off in, the, in this, you know, the, the gravel, the gravel sort of, uh, the, you know, embankment off the side of the road. They were fine. They didn't crash the vehicle or anything. Just this cloud of dust and foam, you know, everywhere. We're like, ah, you know, and so and then we just button everything up, back on the base and in the front gate. And Rooster says, hey, drop me off at the hospital. I want to check out the nurses because he was kind of a ladies man, a single guy. And so um, sure we do. So we pull up to the hospital. You remember where that is? And, and, um, and um, he gets out. I slide over to the driver's seat. Mongo gets in the passenger seat. And then we see all these, like, like SPs. You know, there's, like, cars going over. There. Man, something must be going on. And they pull in right around us, you know, all around us. There's, there's all these SPs. They're getting out. And uh, and then we see behind, like, you know, an SP <coughs> truck coming from the back gate is the civilian pickup truck. Needless to say, we didn't fly in that exercise. <laughs> Me and Mongo and Rooster, we got we got an airline ticket home the next day. We were grounded for for, for a couple of weeks, but we learned our lesson. Oh wow! And um, yeah, so uh, that was our that was my England Air Force base story. Except I will say though, actually, um, we had been there 
let's see, that was, I think we got there on <coughs> Thursday and the exercise was starting on like Monday. And I think on Friday, we had gotten to do another thing. It was cool. Um, we went out to, to Nasty's uh, dad's uh, rice farm, his homestead. And um, his dad had a Satabria. <coughs> so we all, we all got to fly the Satabria. And um, see, we're, um, we're getting a little late here on the, in, the, in the evening. And so I'm going to tell the Satabria story another time. I might even have a special guest, another special guest on for that one. But um, and, and Scott, Scott and my cold is both catching up with us because I'm about to hack. Uh, so. <laughs> I, Scott, you all right? I think Scott's going to be okay. He's just got to go get some water. And I, I told that story just a little too long, but we were both we were both saying before we started that that um, it was going to be a little tough because we were both getting over colds, but. But um, I, I'm I'm more of a talker, <laughs> so I can get by that. But but um, hey, I want to thank everybody that's been in the uh, in the live chat here uh, tonight. Uh, we've got a had a good crowd. I appreciate that. Tell your friends, uh, Warthog Wednesdays. We're gonna have continue to have some great uh, audiences. Um, hey, and watch also for my subscribers. Um, uh, I'm gonna have a, a special offer for my subscribers coming up. Um, so check uh, check the uh, the page out and. Um, I say I know nothing about this. I'm learning, but I think there's probably a way I can email or send you a message too, and I, I'll do that as well. But um, so, uh, and we're also going to start a little segment that uh, we're going to call momentarily mental. We're going to talk about mental health issues, especially as they relate to the military, um, and um, probably you know get some of our past guests on. Now there, see, I've just got the the little water and it's empty. Scott knows how to hydrate right there, man. It's a guy that knows how to hydrate. How you doing? All right, buddy. I'm good. You're gonna make it. Hey, well, I'm not gonna make you talk anymore. We we're wrapping up anyway. But um, Scott, hey man, I want to I want to really thank you for being on tonight. I had a great phone conversation with you um, recently as well. I really enjoyed that. We've emailed back and forth a couple of times. Um, or actually, the the vultures have a uh, have a. Uh, you can't you can't go on it by the way unless you're a vulture. But vultures have our little super secret uh, Facebook page. And um, so we talk vulture stuff, and, and there's been some some couple of vulture reunions. I've not been to one yet, but Scott Scott has, and uh, those are great. But um, so we've we've chatted a little bit back and forth. But um, but this has been a really great opportunity, man. I've really enjoyed having you on. Enjoyed your stories. Um, probably reach out to you again. We'll talk more general aviation stuff one of these days as well. But but um, any parting shots for the folks at home? Still with me? Do you, do you have if you if you can talk? Do you have anything else you want to say before I before we sign off, man? I'm good. All right, cool. Well, man, I really appreciate you being on. Um, appreciate everybody for watching. Uh, tune in again next week at uh, eight ten p.m. for another episode of Warthog Wednesday. And uh, with that, I will say good night. Thanks, brother. Press that button right there.